tied to life like the sun at the center of the invested universe. Ten trillion dollars of loans worldwide are pegged to life uh, Does anybody here have a credit card? Yeah. All right, how about a mortgage? Anybody here have a mortgage? Right. Anybody here on a pension? Oh. All right, we have actually people. So all of these things are pegged, uh, or many of these things are pegged to LIBOR. If it's a variable rate credit card, typically it's based on LIBOR. So instead of it being an 8% credit card, it'll be LIBOR plus 8% or LIBOR plus 9%. When LIBOR goes up, you pay more for your credit card bill. But more importantly, um, cities and towns all over the world, uh, virtually every city and town in the United States, including cities like Philadelphia, they have vast holdings, uh, investment holdings, that are tied to LIBOR. Uh, so when LIBOR goes down, when the rate of LIBOR goes down, cities and towns earn less. They have less money to pay for public services. They can't sweep their streets. They can't hire policemen or fire, firefighters. They have to lay off teachers, and they have to close hospitals. All these things happen when even the tiniest uh, change is made to the LIBOR rate. Uh, a, a fraction of a point, uh, LIBOR manipulated downward can result in tens of billions of dollars of losses worldwide. Or hundreds of billions of dollars of losses. So what did we find out this past week? Uh, we found out that the banks have been manipulating this rate artificially downward. How did they do this? How did LIBOR work? I promise I won't do too much of this inside baseball stuff. I promise my wife I would keep it simple today. Uh, but how do they do this? Every morning, there's a committee, uh, a British-based committee called the British, British Bankers Association. <laughs> and, uh, and they call up, the British, the British Bankers Association calls up 16 of the biggest banks in the world, and they basically ask them, uh, how much are, people ch are other banks charging you today to borrow? And what they do is they take each of those numbers every morning. They make this call at about 11 o'clock every morning. They take those numbers, uh, they gather them together, they average them out, and that turns into LIBOR. So what did the banks do? Um, they got together and they decided amongst themselves, the biggest companies, financial companies in the world, and they made, a, they made an agreement. They said, when that guy calls every morning at 11 o'clock, we're going to lie to him. Uh, we're going to tell him, uh, that it cost us less, uh, that we charge each other less to borrow money. Uh, and this is what they did. Um, and why did they do this? Because, well, they have the opposite situation of most cities and towns in the world. Most banks, most of the time, their portfolios actually lose value as LIBOR goes up. So they artificially manipulated the, ra the, the rate of LIBOR to make more money for themselves personally. And we found out through these settlements, when they released uh, the information, the Department of Justice here in the United States, regulators in, in, uh, in Britain, when they released these settlements today, or uh, last week, we, they released all this evidence. Uh, they released all this evidence um, uh, about how they discovered this manipulation of LIBOR, and they had these amazing things, uh, including transcripts of communications between traders at Barclays and the guy at Barclays who submits the numbers to LIBOR. And he essentially, we have these, these conversations where the trader says, hey, you know, we're, our portfolio today is a little bit unbalanced. Uh, we're going to get hit especially hard if LIBOR is high today. So we want you to push it downward. He literally used those words, push it downward. And in the transcripts, we hear the LIBOR submitter, and he's basically saying, sure, how long do you want me to do that for? Um, and this is an incredible thing. It, it, the, the scale of it is almost unprecedented uh, in, in the history of financial corruption. Um, in order to manipulating LIBOR downward for to make their portfolios better, when I was trying to think of uh, a metaphor to explain what this is like uh, for these guys to just to rig the numbers so that they could make a couple of extra points that day and stealing from every city and every town and every major developed country in the world to do it, it's literally, it's like melting, the, melting Antarctica to water your lawn. Uh, that's what these guys were doing. And we found out that they were doing this. Um, one other additional aspect of the scandal that I want to bring up before I get to my point. Uh, 
when they do this every day, when they take, when they make those phone calls to so those 16 banks, um, they call 16 companies and they throw out the four highest numbers and the four lowest numbers every day. And then they take the eight numbers in between and average those out and make that into live work. Now, why is that important? It's important because that means it couldn't just be two banks that were doing this. Uh, if it was just two banks that were involved in this, they wouldn't have any effect on LIBOR. It has to be at least four. Uh, it's probably more like six or seven. And some people think that when all the information comes out in the end, we're going to find out that every single one of those 16 banks has been doing this for years and years and years. Uh, there are investigations ongoing in in four different countries, and all the major suspects have been implicated. Uh, Bank of America, who's a favorite, of course, of Occupy Wall Street. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, whose CEO, of course, was testifying a couple days ago in Congress. Uh, Citigroup, all the usual suspects. So what does this mean? Why is this significant? Well, think back. What did they say last year when the Occupy movement started? What are some of the things they said about your protests and why you came out? Well. First, they said, obviously, they said you were communist. They always say that. Uh, secondly, they said a lot of you came out because you were jealous. You're simply jealous of rich people. Uh, other people said they're out there protesting because they really want a handout, right? That was, that was what was said often in the press. Middle-aged, rich, white kids. Middle-aged, rich, white kids, exactly. Kids of child, children of privilege who need to take a shower. That was another thing we heard a lot, right? Uh, but the most consistent criticism that we heard was that the Occupy protesters were in denial, that they were afraid to face reality. And what was the reality that you all were allegedly afraid to face? The reality was that some people were successful and you are not. That was always the implication of the, of the, of the criticism, right? Is that what they always said? Well, it turns out, we find out through this LIBOR scandal and other scandals like a municipal bid rigging thing that I, I wrote about last week and some other things, that actually the situation is completely reversed. Uh, that actually it's these bankers, it's these companies on Wall Street who are afraid of reality. Uh, in capitalist terms, they showed the worst kind of cowardice because they were afraid not just of their own images, but they were afraid of the real cost of things. They were afraid of prices. Uh, so they got together, and rather than let the world know how much uh, things really cost, how much it really costs for them to borrow money, uh, rather than let them know, let everybody know what kind of financial shape they were in, they got together and they essentially botoxed themselves. They, they, they rubbed out their balance sheets and they faked the numbers because they were afraid of reality. Uh, and again, this is exactly the opposite of what we heard last year. They said. All of you hated capitalism, right? That was why you came out. You couldn't deal with capitalism, couldn't deal with the realities of capitalism. But it turns out that these banks, actually, they're the ones that are afraid of capitalism. Uh, they're afraid of real prices. Um, and capitalism, obviously, for all its problems, it does have real capitalism. The true free market has some genuine democratic qualities. Uh, in, true, in true capitalism, Two dollars in a poor man's pocket is always worth one dollar more than one dollar in a rich man's pocket, right? That's always true. But what they, the system that they contrived uh, to organize was different. This was a whole bunch of rich guys who kept their hands over their pockets and said, "Trust us, we got three dollars in there," and that's what they did. They they rigged the game so that no matter what happens, they always win. And we have a word for this uh, when people who are supposed to be competing stop competing and they start cooperating. We have a word for it when people are afraid of democracy, they're afraid of free competition, when they get together and they rig the games so that they always win and we always lose. And the word for that is oligarchy. And that's, that's the situation that we're in right now. Uh, and it's much worse than we thought. You know, a few years ago when this scandal broke, we thought this was just a story about individual corruption within banks. But it turns out that it's organized corruption, that, that it's systemic corruption, that this is a vast political problem. I mean, this goes beyond a simple corruption problem. It, it almost becomes almost like a metaphysical problem. If LIBOR, if, which is in everything, it's, it's in the very DNA of the entire economy, if LIBOR is not a real number, 
then it calls into question the very fabric of the financial universe. Uh, if that's fake, almost everything is fake. And we're presented with this enormous challenge about what do we do about this oligarchical system, this entrenched oligarchical system. And that's what we're apparently uh, uh, occupied is, is for. That's what we're here to discuss is what do we do next. Um, and clearly we, it's, it's our responsibility now. So what do we do? Uh, well, how about throwing them in jail? How does that sound to anybody? Yeah. All right. Absolutely. If we can, we should definitely throw them in jail. Uh, things like uh, manipulation of LIBOR. I was talking to a trader on Wall Street last week, and he said if uh, the CEO of Barclays, uh, if he was an Italian mobster, if his name was DeFazio or Lucchese and wasn't Bob Diamond, uh, he'd be looking at about 800 years of RICO charges, uh, and it would, that it would have been done last week. Uh, instead, uh, we have a situation where they're going to pay, pay fines. They're going to be relatively stiff fines for, for Wall Street, but nobody's going to go to jail. So the very existence of this kind of organized corruption, this, this, uh, this very um, uh, powerful and effective and disciplined kind of corruption, it probably precludes the government just saving us by throwing them all in jail and starting over. It's just not going to happen. It's a good thing if it does happen, but it's probably not going to happen. So yeah, better law enforcement, that would be great. Um, regulations, uh, I'm of the mind that the existing laws would probably work if we, if we enforce them, but we might need some new rules to prevent this sort of thing. Uh, but is that going to fix the problem? Uh, Probably not, because this goes deeper. Again, it's deeper than a crime problem. Uh, you, as all of you know, and as those people who are sitting up there in jail tonight know, uh, you can't solve problems uh, with cops and rules. Uh, that's not that you have to solve problems in the hearts of people. Uh, and the situation that we have now uh, is a, is, speaks to a profound sickness uh, in the soul of American society. Uh, just think about what they did, and then think about so, show of hands, how many people mugged an old lady on the way to this rally here today? <laughs> Anybody? Is this just this guy? Okay. Did we not? Did all of you not mug old ladies because it was against the law? Maybe because you were afraid of getting caught? Were you afraid the police were going to catch you? No, you just don't mug old ladies because you just don't. Uh, and we don't. We don't steal from people. We don't hurt people because we want to stay part of society. We want to be part of the of the human community, and when you steal from people, when you hurt people, you become an outcast. Uh, you're, you become alone, uh, and most of us are not willing to do that because we have uh, a connection to other people, But which raises the question of how did this happen on Wall Street, because that's exactly what they were doing, is stealing from old ladies. Uh, forget about Forget about the LIBOR scandal. Forget, forget about all this new stuff. Think about what, hap what happened before 2008 with the mortgage-backed security scandal. Um, what was that scandal all about? It was about big banks, big companies, taking toxic, worthless mortgage-backed securities and selling it to, among other people, uh, state pension funds. So you had ordinary working uh, people who worked hard jobs. They were toll collectors or cops or firemen their whole lives, they saved up money, uh, and then in the end, a bank comes in and they sell them a bunch of bonds that they know are going to blow up in a couple of years because they know how those bonds were made. Uh, that's stealing the life savings of old ladies and old men. Uh, and it wasn't just, we'd understand if a couple of random diabolical sociopathic criminals, if a, if a couple of Bernie Madoff types had done this, we would understand that because Accidents, genetic accidents happen. You're never going to get everybody uh, to, to fall in line. But this wasn't that. This was systemic. This was everybody on Wall Street. Uh, there was 10, 20,000 college-educated professionals openly, willingly doing this and not really having a second thought about it. And so how does that happen? Um, clearly, the fault is theirs, clearly, mostly. Uh, but we have to ask ourselves whether some of this is on us. And it has to be, uh, because clearly society has been neglected to some degree. If, if enough people have lost that sense of community, uh, then, then some of this has to be on us. We must be responsible for some of that neglect. Uh, put it another way, 
Yes, all these banks, yes, they manipulated the political system. Yes, they bought off politicians, right? They did do that. They, they sent armies of lobbyists to Washington to, to change and manipulate the rules in their favor. Uh, they did all these things. They, they gamed the system. But on the other hand, some of that is on us because we allowed ourselves to think that just voting once every four years was all the responsibility we had to take for making the world the way we wanted it to be. Uh, and so we were left in this situation. We, we willingly opted for this sort of hands-off style of citizenship, and they enabled us to do that. Um, and when we did that, when we retreated, and when we became sort of couch potato citizens who let other people make our decisions for us, uh, they, they, we created a kind of void, a vacuum, a power vacuum. And they stepped into that void uh, very cleverly, very, in a very organized way. They stepped into that void, and they decided to make our decisions for us. They created products that made it easier for, for us to have that hands-off relationship. Uh, you know, in the old days, when you wanted to get a mortgage, uh, you had to know your banker, right? Uh, you had to know, he had to know who you were. Uh, he had to be comfortable with what kind of person you were before he was going to give you a loan. Well, they, Wall Street came in in the last 10, 20 years, and they invented new products that made it possible for us to get huge mortgages without talking to a human being at all. We can just call an 800 number or click something on the Internet. They offered us those products, and we bought them. Uh, credit cards. In the old days, you had to know your local restaurant owner, uh, the, the, the local store owner, before he would give you a tab, right? Uh, but that changed with credit cards. Uh, they would just send you stuff in the mail, credit cards in the mail, you filled out a form, and suddenly you didn't have to talk to anybody. Not only do you not have to know the restaurant owner, you don't even have to know your credit card company. Uh, it's a completely impersonal uh, system, and we willingly participated in it. And even worse, and I'm getting to the end, uh, when our cities and towns got into trouble, and we were, when we were faced with really, really difficult decisions, economic decisions, uh, when we had budget problems, and the choice was we have to either raise taxes or we have to cut services, we have to lay people off, um, Wall Street came to us and it said, hey, you know what? You don't have to make that decision right now. We're going to finance that problem away for you. We're going we're to sell you a swap that will allow you to push that problem 10 years into the future, 20 years into the future. So you don't have to make that decision. Your kids can make that decision. Your grandkids can make that decision. And some of us said, you know what, that's a pretty good deal. And a lot of us didn't know we were, we were saying that, but we did. We elected the politicians who made those calls, and we didn't ask any questions about how we were getting along. Where did the money come from? You know, we all knew we were in a recession. We all knew the times were tough. Where everybody was losing their jobs. And yet somehow we didn't have to tighten our belts all that much, uh, or as much as we, sh we thought we should have, probably. And so that's on us. So we have to do better. We have to be involved more. Clearly, that's what Occupy is all about. It's kind of the collective realization that we have to do more than vote, right? Uh, and and that's, what we, that's what we're doing. And it's kind of a cool thing to see. Um, you know, an example, the old days when the SEC created new rules, uh, they would ask the public to submit comments uh, so that they could find out how to tweak the rules and what was best and what was, what was not a good idea. And in the old days, the only people who ever submitted comments were the banks and their lawyers and their lobbyists. And they would submit thousands of comments, and they got the rules that they wanted. We never participated in that process. Well, now we have Occupy the SEC, uh, which writes 100-page comment letters to new regulations that come out, because we're recognizing that we have to be part of this bureaucracy. There's just no other way. Otherwise, we're going to lose. Um, the old days, think tanks, all think tanks were corporate-funded. They were the American Enterprise Institute, the RAND Institute. It was big money that moved public opinion. They were the ones who created the ideas that became laws that shaped our society. And we never participated in that. Uh, and now Occupy itself is becoming like a giant people's think tank. Uh, we're creating new ideas that are going to move society in a direction that's better for all of us, that's better for society. And that's a great thing. And so that's that's how we win. Yeah, clearly we need, to, we need new laws. We need to, to enforce the law when we can. But more importantly, we just have to be involved. We have to take more responsibility for ourselves. When we do that, we succeed. And when we don't do that, the converse is, when we live selfishly, we lose. And the reason we lose is because we lose the moral argument. When we live selfishly, Wall Street kind of calls our bluff. And it says, yeah, okay, you know, you're complaining that we ripped off that old lady, but what did you ever do for that old lady? Uh, and that's what they say, and that's, 
that's kind of their argument. Yes, we're selfish, but so are you, and we're just better at it. Uh, that was their argument last year. That's what that. That's why. What, that's what they meant when they said you're all just jealous of us. They essentially meant we're just better at doing the same stuff that you're doing. We're better at ignoring society than you are. Anyway, so mm. clearly we have to do the opposite. We have to turn the tables on them, and we have to create a society that's so great and so vital that they'll be ashamed to mess it up the way they have in the last 20 years or so. And so everybody being here today and being involved in Occupy across the country, uh, that's a great first step in that direction. And anyway, I'm, I'm very honored to be taking that step with you, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs> we actually have one last speaker, a day one occupier actually from o of OWS. Sage, are you there? Sage? Where'd you go? Sage? You guys are fucking Sage. Sage, are you there? <laughs> Until Sage comes up, I'm going to start some of the announcements because we have a long, hopefully fast list. Um, so this message is from Medic. Drink, 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 then eat, then drink more water. Even though the weather's really nice out now, it still means we all need to drink water. So that's our Medic message. Wellness is up next. So wellness. Thank you. We believe in drinking water too. I'm Alice, I'm from Occupy Hartford, I'm with the wellness team there, and we're creating a wellness team here. What wellness is, is general uh, preventing crises, but also healing. So if somebody's got an emotional crisis, if someone's freaking out, if people are getting into an argument and need to be de-escalated, uh, if we've all gone through something traumatic, like seeing our comrades get beat up and we need a healing circle, any of that is wellness. So look for the light blue triangle on people's clothes. We're probably going to set up a spot next to the medic.